Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our Communicating Across Culture series. My name is Amanda McKendry, and I serve as the Arthur F. and Mary J. O'Neill Director of the Fanning Center for Business Communication. I also serve as an Associate Teaching Professor of Management in the Mendoza College of Business. Today is our final conversation in our four-part series that has examined the communication skills critical to enhancing our cultural awareness, knowledge, and practical skills in an increasingly diverse workplace. Throughout our series, we've heard from experts across the entertainment, telecommunications, and airline industries. We've learned how major brands communicate their cultural values and identity. Our experts have addressed how they not only define diversity, but measure their ongoing efforts to cultivate equity and inclusion across the enterprise. These conversations would not have been possible without our key sponsors. That include the Mendoza College of Business, Notre Dame International, and the Notre Dame Alumni Association. We thank you for your support. Today's discussion is informed by a few pre-recorded videos that are posted on ThinkND. You'll see our professor, Jim O'Rourke, discussing a few critical concepts on intercultural communication. If you haven't had a chance to review those recordings, you can access the videos after today's program. Over 600 people have registered for today's session. This means that many of us are questioning our understanding of communication and culture and seeking to learn more. To discuss these concepts, I'd like to welcome my colleague, Professor Jim O'Rourke, Notre Dame Class of 1968, and Deborah Charlesworth from the Notre Dame Class of 1990. She serves as a VP of Corporate Communications at Biomarin Pharmaceutical. Welcome, Jim and Deborah. For today's program, you can expect to hear a brief overview of Biomarin Pharmaceutical as well as what Deborah is most proud of at Biomarin and how she thinks about diversity, equity, and inclusion. As we explore this company's unique culture, we'll highlight significant changes over the years and future directions. We'll then open the floor for Q&A. If you have any questions for Jim or Deborah, please use the Google form that we are sharing with you now. This will allow us to facilitate the questions as effectively as possible. Now let's turn the program over to my colleague, Jim O'Rourke, a master teacher and expert in corporate reputation. Thanks, Amanda. It's really good to have all of you here. Um, nice you could join us for this, the fourth in our series. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to host all of this. It's not often that an academic has the opportunity to share some of what he or she has been working on uh, day in, day out, trying to produce articles or books or material for the classroom. I think it's wonderful that this moment in history has permitted us to share so much with so many of you. And there's more to come as I understand it. So uh, keep your diary open, jot down the opportunities as they come along. Uh, for those of you who've been in on the first two or three of these, you'll recall that I mentioned a colleague at the University of North Carolina by the name of Gary Ferraro. Gary gave us what I think is a wonderfully simple definition of culture. He said it's everything that people have, think, and do as members of their culture. Have, think, and do covers a lot of territory. So that obviously would include material objects, ideas, values, attitudes, and expected patterns of behavior. One of the things I think we've all observed uh, this year in particular is that ideas and values are shifting. Our culture as a society and the subcultures within which we live in our organizations, our regions and neighborhoods, are undergoing reevaluation, and in so many ways that's illustrative of how language works and how human beings work when they're around one another. Attitudes and expected patterns of behavior follow, and so I think as a society we're in a moment where we're trying to figure out what people expect of us, 
and how we really ought to behave, what we should expect of ourselves. So I've invited a few friends in to help talk about this. Um, Deborah Charlesworth, welcome. Uh, you're, I assume, in your home in the Marina District of San Francisco, am I right? You are correct. I am in sunny San Francisco right now. Yeah, I understand it's 90 degrees in San Francisco. Now, how odd is that in October? I know it, October is thought of as summer there, but I don't think I remember a day ever when it was 90 degrees in San Francisco. So let me just uh, quickly check my phone and see what the temperature is here in South Bend. Uh, <laughs> it is 52 degrees, but I will tell you that, um, again, we have CAVU conditions, ceiling and visibility unlimited. It's a beautiful day outside. You will need a jacket, though. This is one of those wonderful October uh, weekends that uh, everybody at Notre Dame dreams about. I got a message the other day from the county saying we'll be around soon to pick up the leaves. Uh, I sent them a note back saying it'd be helpful if you waited for the leaves to fall off the trees uh, <laughs> before you came around. So we have our own problems to deal with, but none of them uh, terribly serious. Let me begin with one, uh, Deborah. Let me, this is slightly off topic, but how are you and your boys, your daughter, your husband, um, and how is San Francisco and Northern California coping with the fires we've seen, all the damage and destruction? Yeah, so San Francisco has been pretty fortunate. The, you know, the fires are, you know, north of us and south of us. Um, what we get in San Francisco is um, the smoke. So we end up with really bad air quality when the fires are raging and the winds are blowing in our direction, um, where the people who are really hit hard. So, so while that's really hard for people who have any kind of breathing problems, um, they have to stay indoors. So we've had to stay indoors a bunch. Um, it's, that has cleared up a lot. Um, but the folks up in Sonoma and Napa, um, which actually a lot of our employees are based there, um, they have been affected. People have lost their homes. So it's, it's, it's really, it's hard, it's hard. And, and the other thing that happens and people don't realize it, but you know, we're all, we're all working from home. Um, and we rely on our internet and the power and PG&E is cutting off power to prevent wildfires. So we have that added complication. That hasn't happened in San Francisco, but my colleagues who are in Marin County or Napa and Sonoma, they've had their power shut off. And so that just adds another layer of, of um, difficulty in an already unprecedented kind of year. Well, I think anyone who's read the life of Nikola Tesla We'll go back to one of his great ideas, which was a kind of broadcast version of a power source. I, I wish he had lived long enough to put that into uh, action. So, um, and I also know that uh, others are working on uh, battery issues and all of those kind of things. There's nothing like um, a global pandemic to focus your attention on just how we live and how we connect with one another. So let me say thanks. It's, it's wonderful to see wherever it is you are. Um, I don't know if that's a spare bedroom or a hallway, <laughs> but um, thanks for joining us. Um, you're a vice president at a company called BioMarin, and I, that, I know that's named after Marin County, uh, California. And for the viewers, let me situate that for you. Uh, you're just over the bridge in a little place called Novato, California. Can you tell us what that's like? Yeah, so it's interesting. It's, it, we're in Novato and San Rafael. So these are two of the, um, you know, sort of more industrial cities in, in Marin County. Marin County is, I think if you, I'm not, I'm not gonna get the stats exactly right, but um, I think it's only 20% occupied by people and the rest of the, um, the land is, is open. So it's, be, it's a beautiful, beautiful area of the country. 
Um, and it's a little bit isolated. You've got the bridge, you have to go over the Golden Gate Bridge or the Richmond Bridge in order to get to Marin County. Um, and most of the biotechs in the Bay Area tend to be in the East Bay near Oakland or in South San Francisco near the airport. So we're even a little isolated from, from um, our, our peers um, in, in biotech. And then obviously the tech industry is down in Silicon Valley. So we're a little bit isolated and that has its challenges, but it's also um, you know, a remarkably beautiful place. And I, you know, think I'm one of the luckiest people in the world because my commute involved, well, when I used to commute and hopefully someday when I will commute again, um, I drive over the Golden Gate Bridge twice a day. And, and every once in a while, I, um, I'll, I'll be driving over the bridge and a car will be going very slow. And I'm, and I'm like, I got to get going. I got to get going. And I realized that the person, it's, it's a person taking a picture because it's so beautiful and it's so amazing. And it reminds me of how lucky I am. Uh, I, I remember my own days in San Francisco, and I think it's a wonderful place, um, one of the, the more interesting spots on earth. It does not surprise me that smart people would gather there, and thanks to technology and globalization, uh, they've managed to find one another, and they've managed to work on issues of common interest. Now, Biomarin is about 25 years old, if I'm right. And I, I know that Wait, Jim, you got muted. Okay, for some reason I got muted. So let me back up and I hope I'm not repeating myself, apologies. But BioMarin is about 25 years old and um, you specialize in rare diseases. Um, the, I'm told that the company is valued uh, at about $1.3 billion. Uh, I know you have just six products on market right now. We can talk about that. But here's the bigger question. How do you make money on rare diseases? I thought they were, by definition, small populations, not very many people. How do you make money doing that? Yeah, so that's a good question, and it's hard. It's really hard to make money on doing that. Um, we actually have, haven't been profitable. Um, part of that's by design because we decided that we wanted to plow all our revenues back into, into R&D. So we made a conscious decision. Um, when you have small patient populations like we do, um, the challenge is how do you make those multi-million dollar investments in R&D and, you know, and be able to get a return on that investment? Um, some of our some of our patient populations in the U.S. are around uh, 200 people, maybe a thousand around the world. Some of our patient populations are 2,000 people around the world. So, from an economic perspective, um, if you look at the cost of of our drugs compared to a um, you know a, a diabetes drug or something, our drugs are are higher in price. Um, we also higher in value um, because we only do first in class or best in class um, drugs. So a lot of times we're the only um, we're the only company developing a drug in this area uh, because people other companies don't feel like they want they don't feel the investment is worth it. So um, you know we're often going in we're working really closely with the patient um, community because there's so little information. So we're, we're really, we're, we're pioneers. We, we're doing everything from scratch. So a lot of times the disease itself hasn't even really been defined. So we do a lot of work with the patient groups and the physicians to chart the natural history of the disease because you can't, you have to figure out how to treat it. What are the things wrong? How do you design a clinical trial? How do you measure if you're actually making the patient feel better? And, and if you don't understand the disease and how the disease progresses, you, you can't make those, those assumptions. So, so we have to do a lot of different things that drug companies that are in established diseases don't necessarily have to do. 
Well, who owns that part of the operation that deals with patient advocacy groups? I can imagine that these are mostly moms, not entirely, and that they are very insistent people. I, I can only imagine that once they get your email address, they do not go away. So is that part of corporate communication or is that a different part of the company? So it sits actually in a couple of areas in our company. Um, it, it starts out in clinical development. So those are the folks who are doing the clinical trials to determine if the drug is safe and effective. And um, because there, we start at the very early stages, like we are, when we're even thinking about going into a disease area, we start conversations with the patients and the patient groups because we wanna be hand in hand with them as we go through the process because they're the ones who are, are benefiting and, and need to tell us and help us figure out how, how to help them. So everything from clinical trial design, like what, and, and it, it comes to things like what's practical? You know, we've had patient groups say, well, yeah, we know you want to measure this every day, but I'm going to get my kid to school. <laughs> so how am I, you know, from a very practical perspective, we're like, oh, really good point. How can we, how can we rethink that so that the clinical trial is not burdened, you know, as, 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 to reduce the burden of the of being in the clinical trial because remember when people participate in clinical trials um two things happen one they don't know if they're going to benefit right they're not they're doing a big favor for the rest of the patient community by going in there and then if you're in a, a placebo controlled trial right you might not even get the drug in the first go around so, so these are, so you want to make sure like these people are doing like something very heroic and, and you want to make sure that, um, you know, we're doing the right things by them. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, help us out as you, as you walk inside the door, what's Biomarin like as a place to work? How many people there um, and, and what's a day like at Biomarin? Oh, what's a day like? Well, it's going to be different for different people. Um, we have, I will say the one thing like sort of overarching is this patient focus. And, and we're really lucky. And I had mentioned before that the patient, patient populations are really small. So we really get to know our patients on a level that most other drug companies don't don't have the benefit. It's just, a, you know, it's not a practical um, thing to get to know the patient populations in the way we do. Um, they're, they're all patient focused, but we're literally like Facebook friends with our patients. <laughs> it's, it's on that level of, um, you know, communication. So one of the things I learned while you're uh, taking a, uh, a bandwidth break there. One of the things I learned from dealing with um, a group down in Laguna is that patient advocates, usually parents, share information with each other in a way that sort of takes some of the burden off the company and helps organize those groups. Do they do the same for you? Yes, am I back on? You're back on, thanks. Can you hear me? We can. I, okay. <laughs> okay, we good. you a little, but you're fine. Yeah, you know, um, let me share a little story with you about um, a drug that we got approved in Batten disease. And Batten disease is a very rare um, brain disease. It affects children. Some people have called it a reverse dementia. Um, and it's, it's a horrible, horrific um, disease. These children are totally normal until they're about three. They have an, a, a seizure and then the parents try and figure out what's wrong for a couple of years because you go on this, we call it a diagnostic odyssey. And, um, and then they, they slowly decline, lose milestones. So, you know, when you get all excited, when your child takes her 
his or her first step and they say their first words and all those things. And then all of a sudden your children start losing those milestones. It's a, it's, it's a terrible experience um, for, for the families. And the children end up in a, in a vegetative state. They can't walk, they can't talk. And around the age of 11 or 12, they're not with us anymore. So we worked on, we, we worked on that um, disease and we have a treatment. And, um, but the way we got to it was fascinating. There were parents, and you hear this story so often in rare disease. Parents get a diagnosis. They don't, the doc, they say to the doctor, what should we do? The doctor says, go home, love your child. There's nothing you can do. And then what they do is they start raising money and they say, okay, well, we're going to raise money and we're going to do research. And so they have to figure out what is the disease? Is, is it genetic? And then they, they will raise money and um, uh, give research grants to, in fact, in Notre Dame, they do that. Well, that's um, what Errol Parsegian did. You know, he said exactly. to me, um, I don't know anything about medicine, um, but I knew, I do know that you can't play football unless you're organized. He said, I'm pretty good at getting organized. So, um, you know, the, the disease which affected his grandchildren, in fact, had one researcher working on it at the time his first grandchild died. And now there is a documented intervention. I don't know if anyone's calling it a cure, but there is, uh, it's for Neiman Pick uh, type C, there is a documented intervention that uh, either remediates or turns this around. And it really happened as a result of an organized parent or in this case, a grandparent. Um, you know, as I think about BioMarin, uh, I think also about some of the other much larger companies we've looked at. And um, I wonder about culture. Do you measure or manage any issues related to culture? So it's interesting that you've asked that because it's something that's come up recently in our organization. And so we're about 3,000 people all around the world, probably 2,000 people in, the nor in Northern California. When I arrived, I kind of recognized everybody on campus. <laughs> I knew who everybody was when I got here in, in 2012. I don't know everybody anymore the way I used to. Um, and for the longest time, we have a very special culture, and, I, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but we were a little concerned about defining it in a formal way because we thought it might take away some of the authenticity of it. And we thought, gosh, if we, if we start defining it and, and it becomes prescriptive, it doesn't feel like it's coming from the heart. And then that's really where, uh, you know, what we do, the purpose, helping sick children is pretty, pretty purposeful um, uh, way to go about your, your day. Um, you know, we're like worried about that. But what happened is we're now 3,000 people and we have, I think it's about 40% of the organization has only been with the company for less than three years. And so that really moved us to say, okay, we really do need to, we, and, and less about how do we create the culture or shape the culture, but how do we preserve what we have and as we grow and what are those bits and pieces that we can, that are, that have to stay in order to stay true, you know, to keep our DNA. All right. So let's drill in just a little bit further. What parts of BioMarin are you most proud of and what has to change? Right. Um, you know, one of the things when I got to BioMarin, I, I, said, I got there and I said, is everybody really this nice? I, I seriously, I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I thought, this is incredible. Like, this isn't going to last, right? And, and, and when I got there, I remember my boss said to me, he said, I reported into the head of HR at the time. And he said to me, he said, well, look, we've hired you because you're the expert. So we expect you to um, 
to tell us and guide us and counsel us on what we should do. Like he was, he was really empowering me and letting me know, like giving me permission um, to do that, encouraging. And I had been in organizations where I had caught, you know, the, the communications function was second guessed and, and um, always trying to measure and prove and all that. And it was, it was just a, it wasn't that we didn't have to measure what we did. It was just a flip in the perspective of how we think about our people. Well, that probably fits into, you know, so many organizations list a set of values. That fits into the category of respect. And I've seen that myself in large organizations where the senior team knows they need a communication function. They know they need communication experts. They just don't respect them. Uh, <laughs> they honestly believe that they know more about that function than anybody else and they would do it themselves if they had time. Um, but it's, I think it's encouraging to see they respect your judgment and take your advice. Um, as you know, you know, you don't have to um, read a lot of out-of-town papers to figure out that um, the conversation around culture is increasingly about DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And... Um, while I don't think anyone is saying that homogenous organizations are bad or that heterogeneous organizations are all good, the real question is, how do we offer people opportunity? How do we see that they get training and promotion and inclusion once they're here? So how do you think about that? Mm -hmm. So we, we have really, again, been very focused on the, we call it DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. Um, oh, we started really formalizing it last year. Um, and one of the things that I think we are, we're fortunate in that our whole business is based on diversity, right? We are, we're, <laughs> the, our, the patient populations we serve are minorities. They are, you know, there's just, they're, they're, the, they're the neglected um, diseases. And those people who have those diseases are neglected. So we come from, I think, a good foundation to appreciate diversity. Um, we do a lot, um, we, we've, we've started to measure um, with employee surveys. So we do specific um, we did a diversity, equity, and inclusion survey. And for us, that's a big deal because as a company, we're kind of survey averse. We don't like to do too many of them because people are really busy. So when we do them, we try to be very targeted. Um, so that's helped us a lot. We've done focus groups. Um, we look at our the makeup of our employee base. And um, we also put in training programs. We look at our salaries to make sure that the salaries are um, uh, commiserate with the, uh, the job level and that it's consistent across the company. And we, and we look at that um, multiple times a year and we make adjustments as needed. And we do it, you know, on the spot. Um, we have, uh, we actually brought in um, an external group to help us with our uh, diversity efforts. We've done, we've started uh, this year, we've been doing something called dialogue circles, um, which may be something that happens a lot in other companies, but for us, um, that was new, and that's been a really good experience, um, especially this year with everything that's been happening and with the, the social unrest in the company, uh, the company in the, <laughs> in the country. Um, so so that's, been, that's been really great. We also have employee resource groups, so we've been really supportive of those groups. And, and we have within those groups, we have a leader who has a direct line of communication to our executives. Okay. Well, this, the next question I have here really isn't an HR question. It's a hiring manager question. So when you seek to hire someone or promote within the company, what do you look for? I mean, you're obviously looking for something. Uh, are there characteristics, behaviors, qualities, or traits that you look for? And how do you know you got the right person? Right, right. So we have, um, 
we have something called the dial app attributes. <laughs> so, um, and, and those, dial that's how attribute. we, the dial, so D-I-A-L, it's an acronym. Right. And um, it's, it lists these, these attributes, skills that people must have and they're measured against um, in order to get promoted within the organization. So there's, it's decision-making, right? You've got to be, got to be good at that. Um, influence and collaboration. So that's something that, you know, regardless of where you sit in the organization, can, how do you get things done? And can you bring people along with you? Um, agility. Um, we are, like I, I mentioned before, we are constantly in new territory. We're pioneers. And so there's no manual for us. <laughs> no, there's no playbook. And so we constantly have to be able to make changes quickly. So agility is really important in our organization. And, and then leadership. Um, and, and that falls in all areas of our organization, whether it's scientific leadership, um, in our clinical trial development, um, even in HR and um, in our other areas of the organization, we take that leadership pioneering spirit, you know, that's, wo that's, that's woven throughout the, the company. Interesting, where'd you get that? Which, the dial? Yeah, where did you find that? So <laughs> that was our, our HR folks. Oh, uh, I smell um, an HBR article. Uh, I think the Harvard Business Review could benefit from some of this. So what you'll have to do, I'm happy to help you. What you'll have to do is get primacy on this and then step forward with that as, uh, as a uniquely BioMarin sort of brandable item. <laughs> I, I like it though. I think it's it really it's easy to remember. It certainly fits with the culture of your company. Um, let me let me talk about business for just a few minutes, and then we'll move on and take some questions from the folks who are watching online. Um, you mentioned some of your company's new drugs. Now, I think your website says you've got six um, active compounds in the marketplace that are. Uh, intervening <clears throat> in rare diseases of one sort or another. So um, two things. One is about growth. Um, do, is this a company that is going to grow organically, just keep producing new uh, compounds? Or is this an industry that favors acquisition? And I'll come back and talk about what's next. Okay. So we, we do a little bit of both. Um, we also do, you know, those six drugs that are on the market, a lot of them have been on the market for over a decade and they're still growing um, because we still look for new patients. It's not, um, and, you know, for us, it's su success with one of our drugs. Like for us, success is actually getting most of the patient population, right? Because we're the only drug. So our challenge is finding them. Right, so we spend that time finding them. The um, uh, for acquisitions, we tend to do smaller. Uh, well, small, I would call them smaller deals, where we're either licensing or outright purchasing smaller companies that focus in the early stage research. So they're the folks in the labs, and then where we come in is we can take that great scientific research and translate it into a drug. So that's the, that's the tricky in drug, you know, there's lots of tricky parts, but translating from the lab bench into the doctor's office is, is hard. Well, <clears throat> I watched a fellow by the name of Cooper, who's, um, First name I cannot think of. I'm getting it confused with Gordo Cooper, who was an astronaut. Um, but the fellow who um, participated in decoding the human DNA, the, the, the genetic code, said on yeah. television the other day that now that we have um, really good code data, and it looks as though many of the more serious, complicating, horrible diseases are sort of letter mismatches that, um, and this was in response to the Nobel Prize being awarded uh, last mm -hmm. week. Um, he said, we now have tools to be able to go in 
and do that. Is BioMarin part, uh, partnering in that portion of the world where you would use CRISPR or these other new uh, biotech tools? Yeah, so th this is the most exciting time for biotechnology. And um, yes, I mean, the, the, um, the path of genetics has opened up so many possibilities for us that um, it's amazing. We have um, a couple of drugs in development and it's, it's called gene therapy. And this is, let me, I, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on our pipeline and how we think about it. But a lot of our drugs previously, you know, the, the approved drugs is your body has some kind of uh, genetic defect, right? Something's wrong, your genes aren't, one gene isn't doing what it's supposed to do. And so um, your body isn't able to produce something it needs. And so we replace it. And so that, and you have to go get infusions every week or every two weeks to replace what's missing. Yeah. With, with gene therapy, what we're doing is we're inserting the gene, the corrected gene into the, your body so that your body can then produce what it needs to produce. So before we were doing it outside the body. Yeah with, um, um, uh, you know, with, with, with the drug outside. And now we're trying to, now with, with gene therapy, what we're trying to do is to, um, there's my daughter. <laughs> okay, no, 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 honey, honey, just can you wave and say goodbye? Hi. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, please, honey. Um, so um, the, uh, what I was gonna say is, is with, with the, when you put the gene in, you're getting your body to do your own thing. So it's, it's more natural. Well, uh, one of the things that Dr. Cooper mentioned was that in the CRISPR process where they take the corrected gene letter, they insert it in a virus, but the virus they're using is um, the human immunovirus. The virus associated with uh, AIDS, the acquired immune deficiency. Um, can you can you talk about that? It sounds scary, but he said, "Oh, nothing to worry about. That virus is completely disabled." Right. So, um, so I'm not a scientist, but I know a lot of scientists, and I talk to them a lot. Is can you hear me still? Yes. I, gotcha. Okay. Good. Um, so it is it is a virus, but it's not a virus that can transmit disease. It's been um, uh, it's, a, it's safe, right? And so it's really a delivery mechanism to get into to the body. Um, the challenge with the virus is um, using that as a, as a delivery mechanism is you have, um, if you've been exposed to the virus, you have immunity to it. So then the, you, that delivery mechanism doesn't work. Right, mm. because your body has built up immunity to it, it's been exposed at some point. So um, if so it were an ordinary rhinovirus, for example, everybody's had a cold, that particular virus wouldn't work on a patient. Exactly, exactly. So you want to find the viruses that haven't had a lot of human exposure so that you have a better chance of being, being able to treat people. So when we conduct our clinical trials, and we're still in clinical development for our gene therapies, um, the participants in the trial take a test to see if they have immunity um, to, we call it a vector, to our vector. Interesting. So <clears throat> I know that the Securities and Exchange Commission is trying very hard uh, not to give people inside stock tips, but I wanna know what's next at BioMarin. I wanna know what you're working on. So what can you tell us? So, so gene therapy is very exciting. Um, that's an area that we feel has a lot of promise. Um, we're also working on, we have a drug in late stage development. Actually, we've um, just submitted all of our data to the regulatory authorities for them to evaluate the safety and efficacy so that um, if they determine it's safe and eff efficacious, we can, we can market it. 
Um, but this is a drug to help with the most common form of dwarfism. Um, and it, dwarfism has a lot of um, comorbidities. And so people who have dwarfism have, uh, they have a lot of back problems. They have spinal stenosis, they have sleep apnea. There's a lot of issues um, that those folks ha have, not everybody, but many of them do. Um, and we've actually ha uh, have an intervention that has um, to help pro create proportional growth for people with achondroplasia. And our um, and we are now trying to we are measuring and trying to understand how that may impact down the road those comorbidities, those other issues that come up as a result of uh, achondroplasia. Okay, so. Amanda, any questions for us yet or no? Amanda McHenry, can you hear me? I can now, yes. Okay. We do have one question for Deborah, And one of our participants would like to hear how her experiences as a varsity athlete provided a foundation or any key learnings that have been applied to DE&I efforts even today. Um, that's a great question. So um, I played field hockey at Notre Dame. <laughs> I was a right wing. <laughs> and, um, you know, the thing about sports is it is a great equalizer because it's a very, it's very measurable, right? I mean, you, you score goals, you steal the ball, you, you know, it's, and, and um, it's all about your performance. And, you know, you don't start unless you're performing. And I think that is a great, um, a great way about keeping things fair and equitable and making sure that um, people who might not get a chance because of who they are to get a, get a chance, get, get to prove themselves. Well, you and, know, that's one of the things Bill Bradley, who famously played basketball at Princeton um, with four other white boys. Uh, he said it was a shock when I moved to the NBA and I was a suddenly the minority. And he said basketball and athletics are a great equalizer. Um, by the way, Colin Paul said the same thing to me about military service. But Bill Bradley said, if you're going to shower with these guys and if you're going to go on the road with these guys, and you're going to play basketball, he said, it's about the game, it's about how you treat each other, and it's about trying to produce the results you know you can, so everybody gets a fair chance. So, yeah. um, and you have I, to work together, right? I mean, you're all trying to, you all have a very clear goal, win the game, right? And you yeah. can't win the game if everybody's not working together and in sync. Right. I'm, I'm so sorry our field hockey team now has been, uh, may I say, resigned to the dustbin of history, um, but we do have a wonderful women's lacrosse team, and I'm an advisor to the team, and Coach Halfpenny, I think, is just wonderful. We've got a, a terrific collection of young women who are really pretty good. They've been sidelined for the semester, and I'm really hoping they get back on the field sometime soon. So a couple of questions that every Notre Dame uh, grad wants to ask. What did you study? Where did you live? Ah, okay. <laughs> so I lived in Lewis. I was a Lewis chicken. Um, and <laughs> I had, I, um, I got my degree in government. So I was a liberal arts major. And then I had a, a minor in in business, do they still have the, it was called the Alpha program. Do they still have the Alpha? Well, it was there's an arts and letters for professionals. Yeah, there is a version of that program and it's designed to take those who may wanna work um, <clears throat> in the medical or biological sciences or in physics or elsewhere without actually majoring in it. Because if you major in it, you have to turn your life over to it. Mm -hmm. and. Um, we're doing a little of that in business. You know, we, we have minors now in business so people can come get some of the basics. And one of the things we've discovered was smarter students that they, they're willing to take on more. Um, I think Notre Dame for many years was so protective 
they didn't want you to load up with a lot of courses, but there are many more opportunities. And if you apply yourself, you can find the chance to learn all sorts of things. So you had the back view of the dome, am I right? I did, I did. Yeah, and but we, you did a nice <laughs> view of the lake. Great view of the lake. And occasionally we would hear the guys from Zon, they would throw people in the lake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my father lived in Zom. I know exactly what you're dealing with. So um, one of the things I would like to talk about uh, before we move back to questions is your corporate communication team. How many people do you have and how are you organized? So we are a small but mighty group. <laughs> um, and if, if you have any uh, org charts that I can take to uh, my boss with bigger, <laughs> I'd, be, I'd welcome them. Um, we are, there's four of us. And um, I have one person who does internal communications. Um, I have another person who, um, works in Europe and she does all the communications in, in Europe. Um, and then I have, uh, we have an assist, uh, a, am I forgetting something? Yeah, we have an assistant. Now I, I have, next year I am building my team and what I've done to kind of fill out so that, I mean, we punch way above our weight because um, we have really good agency support. So we have public relations agencies who can help us execute on a lot of our, our work. Well, if you add one person to your team, you've increased by 20%. So, I mean, you can, you can make big numbers in a hurry. Um, I think about, do we have a Notre Dame grad who is now Chief of Sustainability and Global Impact at McDonald's, and I've, I've been talking with her. Um, their teams are just jaw-dropping. I mean, the communication team has 300 people. Um, uh, you couldn't possibly know them all. You would all have to have name tags with your photos. Um, so you rely very heavily on consultants and agencies for help. Do you foresee the day when ramping up is going to be essential? Yeah, I, the, in the next year or two, we are, and, and I've been talking with management about this, is that you know we do need to scale because right now we're really um uh, under from a from a from a personnel standpoint we we need we need more staff and we are uh definitely on the lower end of the spectrum on on staffing um when i look at some of my peers even just here um you know there there's much more i will say i don't think we need as many as some of our peers, I mean, we're, we'll still be a lean organization and we're just really efficient and we don't do, you know, we just can't do stuff that's not on target and focused on our goals because yeah. you just have to be brutal about that. It makes you sort of attach a value weight to each of the proposals or activities. Um, uh, I, I really do find that interesting. The area that, of course, I think interests me now is the digital space. If you think of marketing and communication as a kind of MasterCard logo, there's that part in the middle, which is digital, that's shared both by marketing and communication. And it requires some expertise that regular folks don't seem to have. Um, how do you, who do you lean on to make sure you're doing the right things and getting the most out of your digital capabilities. Yeah, so that's something we've been focusing on a lot this year and, and ramping up even more um, because it is so powerful and measurable and we work really closely with the marketing team. So we have our corporate channels and then we have our marketing channels and can you still hear me? It says- Yes, good. you're doing fine. Okay. Um, we, um, we work really closely so that we, and we share a lot of content and that also helps like from an efficiency standpoint and an amplification, right? So we're, we're, we're using a lot of each other's content um, from a, the thing I also think is really important with the digital communications and we're trying to build in is that it's also a great way to understand just what's going on and trends 
and to see, you know, to start to anticipate issues before they happen, right? Because you can start to see conversations bubble up and you can see who's, who's talking about them and are they influencers and what's their reach. And if it does catch on to certain people, you can end up, you know, in a place you don't want to be. Um, and you, you want to be able to, um, to be able to influence that conversation as much as possible. And so monitoring those conversations, understanding what's going on and knowing those trigger points, like when is it, when, when do we start to put into motion those things we need to do uh, to address potential issues that are coming up in, in social media that can then blow up elsewhere. Yeah. I don't think there's been anything quite as confusing in the last uh, six months as social media. I will tell you, I have left Facebook and I don't miss it. Um, I, I wrote Mr. Zuckerberg a letter, which I'm sure he didn't read, but I honestly think my, my life is better for it. Um, but you know, I see each day people in large organizations struggling with the issue of how they should present themselves. Uh, a friend in London a couple of years ago said, keep in mind, brand is what you say you are. Reputation is what everyone else says you are. Yeah. So are you listening to those people? Are you paying attention? You may not like what you hear, but are you paying attention and then, of course, the big question is, what do you do with all of that? Mm -hmm. uh, let me ask Amanda. We've got about uh, four or five minutes left if we have another yes. question. We or... are approaching the end of our time together for today. And we definitely would like to thank Deborah for taking some time to speak with us, um, providing an insider's view of communication and culture at BioMarin. And of course, sharing the stories that really describe the incredible work that you are doing. We'd also like to thank our participants. If this was our first session with you, we hope that you will join us again for a future series. And for those of you that were able to participate over the past eight weeks, thanks for staying along with us. Um, and we hope you enjoyed the experience as much as we did. Thanks for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you again at a future series. Make sure that you're staying connected with ThinkND and be on the lookout for some new programming coming your way. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Good. Hope to see you back on campus soon. I know. I want to come back. <laughs> Thanks, Thank everybody. You, everybody.